Good singing. Let's all be seated together and turn in our Bibles to the 14th chapter of Acts. There are 28 chapters in this lengthy book, a third of which are speeches. We are in the narrative section of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. They have been to Pisidian Antioch. There has been a division, and eventually they have been uh, persecuted and caused to leave the town. This morning we really want to spend some time, since the account at Iconium is rather brief, we want to spend a little time seeking to decipher why the Jews had such hostility to Paul and Barnabas in their mission. The gospel is first to the Jew, Paul says, and then to the Greek. The Lord Christ was the Jewish Messiah. The Lord Christ gave himself for the nation of Israel. And it seems curious to some when they read the book of Acts, the hostility of the Jews and their response of persecution to those who taught the gospel message. So perhaps we can gain a little bit of insight into that and perhaps be, uh, understand why that takes place and I think it is suitable for us to grasp that and understand that because the pattern is going to remain the same right through the book of Acts. So let's read uh, Acts chapter 14 verses 1 through 7 and see if we can make some headway in our study of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 14 verses 1 through 7, the account of Paul and Barnabas at Iconium. Iconium is 90 miles southeast of Pisidian Antioch. You see it there on the map that is enclosed in your bulletin. So 90 miles on foot, that's quite a good little distance. And they arrive there as we pick up the story in verse 1. <coughs> Once again, the word of the Lord. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. Therefore, they spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it, and fled to the cities of Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. The Jewish people of the first century lived a rather precarious existence. They were imperiled on both sides. On the one hand, they confronted the Jews, the, excuse me, the Romans of the Roman Empire. They had to deal with the particularly tyrannical policies of the Roman Empire. But they eked out, literally by the grace of God, they eked out an unique arrangement with the Roman Emperor, the Roman Senate, and the Roman uh, civic order. They were granted, among all other peoples, they were the only ones granted, the privilege of having their own God and worshiping him exclusively. All other peoples in the Roman Empire were required to worship the pantheon of Rome and to do obeisance to the emperor often simply by offering a sacrifice to his image. But the Jews had eked out this 
perilous relationship in which they were able to live in the communities of the Gentiles. They were able, in many cases, to prosper in a socioeconomic manner. They were able to live and prosper in some regions of the empire quite nicely. But it was a precarious peace, and they were intensely jealous of guarding that status that they had of being able to worship the God of Israel in the temple at Jerusalem and still being able to coexist with their overlords, the Roman emperor. So all other peoples did not have that arrangement and sometimes that bred jealousy, factions, and even outbreaks of disturbances, riots, and other sorts of things. If we go through the first century, we can find many historical examples of friction and disagreement and even battles between Gentiles and Jews in local cities and in the places of the Roman Emperor, Empire. So it was an uneasy peace. And it was in, in the Jewish favor to maintain a status quo peacefulness with the Gentiles, peacefulness with their Roman overlords, and being able to move forward in their economic activities and in their communities, worshiping the true and living God and living in peace with God and man. Now enter the fledgling Christian messianic sect that became a part of first, sec first century Judaism. All of a sudden, not over, or only are there ones believing in a Messiah who was crucified by a, Roman, by, a, by a Roman procurator, not only were there ones in the community who worshiped him, the Lord Jesus Christ, again one condemned by the Roman Empire, put to death by Pontius Pilate. Not only did they contend with that particular belief, but now, since Antioch, they had to contend with their most dangerous problem. And that was Gentiles beginning to come into the community of the Jews. And under the leadership of the apostles, they sought the ability to worship in the synagogues and the grace to continue in the Jewish um, community and among the covenant people. And what did that do from Rome? Rome now begins to look upon the Jewish people as using their unique religious beliefs as a protection for the Gentiles who were coming into the movement and who were now claiming themselves to be under the Jewish covenant and under the Jewish uh, religion. And so the status quo of religious liberties, cultural freedom, and the ability to pursue their lives is in danger. And I think a way to illustrate this is to show this from another part of the scripture. If you would please turn to John chapter 11. Here we have a very familiar story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And the foment that results from this dramatic miracle. We want here to look at the response of the Sanhedrin and the Jewish rulers. Verse 47, chapter 11, verse 47 Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation." So here we see the 
the status quo being disrupted by this dramatic miracle of Jesus Christ and the fear now of the Jewish community that there may be some sort of movement or uprising and that movement and that uprising will be quelled by Rome and they will lose their place, the Sadducees being in league with the Romans and being secure under them as long as they kept the Roman law and the people of Israel being, being uh, sub, now to be subjected to stricter Roman rule without the privileges of Roman uh, acquiescence to their religion. So you see here the, the um, peoples, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees are worried, what are we going to do? There's going to be a tumult We'll lose our status quo. We'll lose our religious freedoms and liberties. The Romans will take over our nation and re re retract the privileges that we have uniquely enjoyed. So you see, disturbances were what Rome did not tolerate. As long as the Jews were quiescent, as long as they made prayers for the emperor daily in the temple, they were left alone. But if there was disruption or there were battles within, the Romans would step in and take away their special privileges. And that's what's taking place in Pisidian, Antioch, and Iconium here as we read this section this morning. There is an auspicious and favorable and promising beginning and then there is the recognition on the part of the Jews that if Gentiles come in in mass and that they expect the same privileges that Jews have, it is going to upset the equilibrium, upset the, the uh, privileges that Rome has granted them, and Rome will take away their freedom to worship in the temple and perhaps even subjugate the temple itself. So in chapter 14, with that explanation, we have an understanding of what happens in verses 1 and 2. They entered the synagogue of the Jews, spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. The same pattern now of a favorable initial response and then upon reconsideration the Jews resisting and disbelieving the message. Why? Because they are threatened with unrest and the disturbance of the status quo and the probable result that the Romans will step in and remove their uniquely granted privileges. So they do not want at all a, a disruption of the status quo, rather they wish to continue worshiping in their synagogues in peace and pursuing their cultural privileges without interference from Rome. But this is what takes place when Paul and Barnabas come in and preach the gospel. The community is divided and he will tell us, he that is Luke, will tell us that again in the passage as we move through it. So, the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. So now we are going to see a tactic that is not without some foundation that the Jews used to embitter. It means to, it's translated in some uh, translations to poison the mind. We've talked about this a little bit, but I think it will help us to review it. First of all, as far as Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel, they had to acknowledge, we learned in chapter 13 and verse 27, that the Jewish rulers had disbelieved in Jesus and rejected him. Luke uses the word condemned, so that the Jewish leaders condemned Jesus. And there are numbers of reasons given in the Gospels for that. First, Jesus was claimed to be a magician or in league with Belial or Belial, if you will, 
the prince of darkness. Now, earlier in this book, we've learned that Sergius Paulus on the island of Cyprus, we have learned that he had someone apparently as a court attendant who was a Jewish magician. His name was Bar-Jesus or Elymas, and Paul has a row with him, and you remember that from a previous chapter. But this shows the frequency with which Jewish magicians occupied the scene of the first century. They were not uncommon. We'll run into Jewish exorcists again in chapter 19. And so these types of individuals were a part of the, of the cultural landscape of the day of Jesus, during the day of Jesus. So the enemies of our Lord identified Jesus with this element of the social order. They claimed that he was working magic and that his deeds, which they could not deny, were performed by the power from below. Next, we learned in the Gospel of Luke when we studied that, that he was also called a false prophet. And of course, the penalty for being a false prophet was death. And on many occasions, Jesus was called a false prophet. And then under, in his trial, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel, rejected his claims of Messiahship and also charged him with blasphemy, claiming himself to be the Son of God. So there was a host of different um, methods by which the Jews had to poison others about believing in the Lord Jesus. Don't you know he, was, he worked by black magic? Don't you know he was a false prophet that misled Israel? Don't you recognize he claimed to be the Messiah and was crucified and hung on a tree proving that he in fact was under the curse of God? There was a repertoire of uh, a panoply of, of identifications of Jesus that were convert, with which people were conversant in the first century that discredited our Lord and discredited uh, the Christian movement. And so that seems to be what's taking place in verse 2. The Jews are using these examples to show the, to, to Gentiles who may have believed the reasons for not believing in the Lord Christ. Then, of course, there is the most stunning of all uh, facts about the life and ministry of our Lord, and that is that he was crucified um, by Pontius Pilate. So Rome had also rejected him, and the technical reason was that Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews. He was crucified and put to death as an insurrectionist, though Pilate, the Gospels tell us, knew him to be innocent the Bible says in Matthew that they delivered him for jealousy, but nevertheless the charge stuck and the official charge was that Jesus died as an insurrectionist against Rome and was put to death for claiming to be another king, not Caesar. Now, this brings us to the question of the confession that was made by Christians in the first century, particularly by Gentiles. The first creed, perhaps, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5 may be first, but right up there among the very first Christian creeds were, Jesus is Lord. In the context of the Roman Empire, to claim another Lord was to invite execution. And so Gentiles now, as we find here, Gentiles are beginning to come into the church, taking up the creed, Jesus is Lord, and yet, because of their assimilation into the synagogues at first, and because of their association with the Jewish people, they should have gained the privileges that the Jews enjoyed, a freedom from persecution, and the exercise of religious liberties. And yet what that was doing is 
bringing about a situation such as we saw in John chapter 11, where there is foment, social ferment, if you will, and disturbance with Gentiles claiming that Jesus is Lord and Jews wishing to resist that with all their might so that their status quo can continue and they can uh, proceed in Roman culture without disturbance. We know in AD 49, likely the next year to the present time, we're probably in AD 47 or 48. And in the next year, we know that the uh, Roman emperor expelled all the Jews from Rome because we have a written account of a division over Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, a division over Crestus. And what most historians believe is that that was a, was a dispute over Christ, that Crestus has been misunderstood and the dispute is really over Christ. So in Rome, the church at Rome had a solid beginning, had a fairly strong uh, showing in, the, in Rome, and yet Jews who disbelieved would have been at odds with them, and there was such a dispute there that Claudius, the Roman emperor, expelled all Jews from Rome. And we can see in that another example of the tenuous and delicate relationship that the Jews had with the Roman Empire. As soon as there's a disturbance, then the Jews are uh, put on warning, or they are expelled from Rome, or worse, they are in danger of losing their privileges of worshiping the one true and living God and not having to bow down to the Roman pantheon and the Roman Caesar. So these are various examples of it, and this is what is taking place now, not only in Antioch, but in Iconium. Now, we move on to verse 3, where we find also a familiar pattern. When we come to the church at Thessalonica, we'll find the same event where Paul and his associate uh, make a small beginning, and yet they are driven from the crowd, from the town by riots and by uprisings, and they leave behind a small and uh, very young Christian community. What we have here is a wonderful example of Paul and Barnabas and their attachment to their community of believers. Remember now, we've read here that a large number, verse 1, a large number of people believed, both Jews and of Greeks. Then comes the stirring up, but Paul and Barnabas do not leave Iconium. It may be that Paul took up some leather work so that he could provide as they lived in perhaps the district. We're not sure if they were able to retain uh, a hospitality in Iconium or in the district of Lyconia. But whichever, they did manage to stay on and mentor and tutor and disciple the converts that had been made in Iconium. Look at the verse 46 of the previous chapter, and you read there, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiated and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. That word boldly. Look again in verse 3. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. And we find here an example of the courage and the discipline and the determination of Paul and Barnabas. That they are determined to do all that they can to remain in the district of Iconium in order to disciple the believers there. Apparently a large number of both Jews and Greeks had believed and they demonstrate great courage using the word boldly again. Luke says, not only in Antioch were they bold to protect the church, but now also in Iconium, they don't leave right away. Something else takes place here in verse three 
that is extremely interesting and I hope will be helpful as you read through the books of the New Testament. These are the churches, these churches on this missionary trip, these are the churches referred to in the book of Galatia, Galatians. In other words, the Iconian church, the Lystra church, the Derby church, we'll come to those two next week. These churches are among those to whom Paul wrote the letter of Galatians. So we're able to bring the his historical record together. These churches that he is grounding in the faith were the very churches that were beset by Judaizers and to whom Paul wrote the next year, probably A.D. 48, wrote the next year to these churches warning them about the encroachment of, uh, of another gospel into the churches that Paul and Barnabas had founded at Antioch at Iconium, at Derby, and at Lystra. Now, we have an example of that and a very interesting one as well. Note what it says in verse 3 at the end of the verse. It tells us here that they were in reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of His grace. And He was doing so by granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Now, it's been a while, but you may remember me saying that the manner in which people are converted is depicted by Luke in different ways. Some of them, like Paul, are struck down, or Paul uniquely struck down on the road to Damascus. Others have apostles come to the Samaritans, lay their hands on them, and they receive the Spirit. Others... Uh, speak in tongues and give evidence of the Spirit's rebirth, such as Cornelius. But these conversions appear with a different secret sequence, a different format, so that they're not all recorded with the same sequence and format. Well, here we don't have mention of baptism in a, at Antioch or at Iconium. Very unusual because... The, the practice was to baptize immediately converts. But Luke doesn't mention it in, in these two instances. We don't have laying on of hands. We don't have speaking in tongues. But what we do have is now, unusually, and in a text we wouldn't have thought of it appearing in, he tells us here that they worked signs and wonders in Iconium. In other words, in the ministry at Iconium, the Lord testified to His Word of grace, a passage that tells us that the Word is a means of grace. The Word of grace, the Word which carries grace, which confirms grace. So we have a statement there that, uh, that an element of grace in the church is the Word as a primary means of grace, the Word of grace. But it says also that God testified to that word of grace by allowing Paul and Barnabas to work signs and wonders. It'll only take a second. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5 where this is confirmed. Galatians 3 and verse 5. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. And Paul is making the point, of course, that, that they received the Holy Spirit and they also were, uh, could testify visibly to wonders wrought among them. And that was done by their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ rather than by obedience to the law. He's making that point over against the Judaizers in this letter. But what verse 5 also communicates to us is that they were the recipients of wonders that were wrought by the Holy Spirit. And this is again a passage from the book of Galatians and we know that the church at Iconium was one of the churches to which he wrote. 
So Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5 is harking back to Iconium where Luke tells us that the word of grace was confirmed by signs and wonders. So signs and wonders took place in Iconium and a great number were added to the church. Galatians 3 verse 5 simply confirms what Luke writes in chapter 14 and verse 3. Alas, the division takes place, verse 4. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of, cities of Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe. So they stayed as long as they could, boldly declaring the gospel. God, by the work of the Spirit, confirmed by Galatians 3, 5, worked many signs and wonders there. A church is begun, and later on we'll return to Galatians again and see that Galatians was written to this group of churches which were founded on Paul's first missionary journey. And we'll pick up next week with the result of what has happened here, uh, like, like Ionia, Lystra, and Derby, and the surrounding region, and they continued to preach the gospel. And what we're going to see now is this same pattern of Jewish not only having theological disagreement, not only having cultural differences, not only wanting to maintain their distinctive Jewish customs, but also the problem with Gentiles coming into the church, proclaiming Jesus as Lord, and putting the entire Jew Jewish community in jeopardy of losing their freedoms that had been uniquely granted to them by Rome. And next week, we'll come to Lystra, where, curiously, they identify Paul and Barnabas as two Greek gods. And so we'll pick up the text there. Thank you. Father, we uh, rejoice to know that these men were bold and careful, that they took care of their converts insofar as they were able. We understand that they were persecuted and driven from Iconium, and we know that they will be attacked and Paul will be left for dead in Derby, in Lystra rather. So Lord, we, we pray that we may see the difficulties that the apostles faced in proclaiming the message of Christ in the Jewish synagogue. And Lord, as we conclude, help us to remember our obligation to this day to be good and faithful witnesses to the Jewish people around us, to give a good example to them of Christian faith, and to be able to explain to them the reason for the hope that lies within us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.